The Switch Lite hasn't arrived just yet, but we have managed to get our hands on the next best thing, the new HAC001-01 revision of the standard Switch, bringing with it the long-awaited arrival of the new die shrink revision of the Tegra X1, codenamed Mariko. On the face of it, aside from the new model number and the inclusion of the new processor, there's nothing to differentiate the old Switch from the new. And let's be clear here, if you do have an older model, I can find no real reason whatsoever to upgrade unless battery life is really, really important to you. And you don't like USB-C power banks for some reason. Regardless though, this is a newer, more power efficient model. In fact, the efficiency here is really quite impressive, but more on that in a bit. Okay, so this video isn't exactly on the short side, which may sound odd if so little has actually changed. But bear with me on this one, there's still a lot of interesting data to wade through. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the package to see if there's anything new there. I'm going to be seeing if the Switch's notoriously poor Wi-Fi reception has improved. I'm going to be running power consumption tests putting new and old units through some thermal imaging, running the rule over screen quality, and yes, taking a look at that all-important battery life. So, without further ado, let's get going. And where shall we begin? Well, first up, let's begin by taking a look at the packaging. In order to get this review ahead of the machine's Western launch, we actually imported a unit from Hong Kong. Uh, which was lucky enough to receive an early debut for the new version of the Switch hardware. So yeah, expect some possible changes for the Western release. First impressions though, well, aside from a new Joy-Con themed artwork on one side of the box, pretty much identical to the old model. Opening up the packaging, the contents and the arrangements are all 100% the same as my existing Switch and the peripherals included are the same too. So no surprises there. And uh, yes, unfortunately the dock is still a bit cheap and nasty, sorry. So yeah, remember when uh, Nintendo chief Doug Bowser told us not to expect any other new hardware this year after Switch Lite? Well, you can see why he wasn't bigging this one up as a new SKU. I mean, it's essentially the same, right? Dimensions, weight, packaging, the internals, the peripherals, the lot. But if you're buying a Switch now, the new model is the one to have. And I'd say that the way to categorically ensure that you have the correct one is to physically inspect the unit and ensure that your HAC001 does indeed have that bracketed dash 01 afterwards. It's the only way to be completely sure. What I can say is that despite the new unit having a lower power requirement thanks to its new processor, you can still use your new switch with an older power supply and vice versa. They are entirely the same in terms of the power output. And yes, existing hardware that works with the older switch, Joy-Cons, Pro Controllers and whatnot, all tested and working on the new machine. That's the obvious stuff then. I did notice a very obvious difference between my old model and the new Switch, and I'm not actually sure it's an improvement as such. So yeah, check this one out. I'm talking about the screen quality. Until there's a teardown, we won't be able to know what's new with the Switch display, and to be clear, the screen may well have changed already in the last couple of years on different revisions of the launch model. There have been reports of Sharp delivering a new IGZO screen for this one though that may well be for the Switch Lite. Regardless, here's the eShop screen on my old Switch, and here it is on the new Switch. There's a very slight tint to my older machine's screen, but by and large, white is white. However, on the new Switch, there's no doubt whatsoever that there's a prolific red tint that is affecting every part of the presentation here. Whether this is down to my specific unit, whether it's down to the new batch of displays, well, obviously, I don't know. I can only work with what I've got here, and well, there it is. But let's concentrate on the positives then. If you've watched my recent Switch videos, you would have heard a lot about Logan, the code name for the original Tegra X1, 
founding the OG Switch, along with Mariko, the new version found in Switch Lite and this new Dash 01 model. So what's the difference? Well, the original chip ran on a 20 nanometer fabrication process, a dead-end technology that was only used on a handful of products, mostly cell phone based in nature. Nvidia itself tested Tegra X1 on this 20 nanometer process, but never moved any of its GPUs across onto the new technology, which kind of says it all really. Vendors like Apple quickly moved on to better chip fabrication techniques, and Nintendo finally follows suit with a smaller, cooler, more power efficient Tegra X1. Yup, Mariko is a lot more efficient, and I'm about to show you just how much. Fast RMX is notoriously tough on battery life, and the inference, therefore, is that it is a rather power hungry game. So here's the OG Switch up against the new Mariko model in an area of the game where we can effectively lock the content. So that's a straight A to B comparison with my wattmeter results superimposed at the bottom there. So this is Fast RMX docked with gameplay synchronized with power draw taken from the wall. Across the run of play, the new Switch draws around 40% less power than the older model, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. But that does seem to be the general reduction in power draw there. Let's match up some Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild action and see what we can see there. I mean, we're just a touch away from halving the overall power consumption here. Six to eight watts for Zelda with the new machine, and that's quite an impressive feat in my opinion. And yes, this translates into a genuinely large improvement in battery life. Zelda Breath of the Wild seems to be Nintendo's own benchmark for Switch stamina, so let's go with that. I play the game until we reach the intro vista shot with the game logo, and then to stop the Switch dimming the screen and dropping automatically into sleep mode, I use the highly advanced technique of taping the right stick to move very, very slightly to the right at all times. The camera gets set up, the clock set to 12, and then, well, essentially I go away for five hours and get on with more important things. The time-lapse capture rate on my camera is set to two frames per second so I can capture the precise point the battery fails. For the original Logan model switch, time is up at three hours, four minutes. That's at 50% display brightness, by the way. Meanwhile, the Mariko model continues. And continues some more. One hour later, it's still going. 4.5 hours of Zelda, and the battery still hasn't given out. Five hours and we're still in business, but the end is near. In this test, again with 50% brightness on the LCD, the Mariko switch dies at five hours, two minutes. So that's 302 minutes versus 184. 64% more playtime. Hardly insignificant then. Next up, I re-ran the test this time with max brightness on both units, which tends to be the way I play the Switch outdoors. So in theory, max brightness means a higher proportion of juice going to the display, not just the chip. This will reduce battery life, obviously. On my older Switch, Zelda drops out after two hours, 25 minutes. So we've lost 40 minutes there or 22% of our battery life. The new Dash 01 Mariko unit, well, the battery lasts for four hours, 18 and a half minutes. Interestingly here, we've lost only 15% of our battery life or 43 and a half minutes versus 50% brightness. I expected more of a drop, but hey, I'd say that's an excellent turnout overall. So there may have been some tweaks with a new display, but what is certain is that the new Mariko Tegra X1 is delivering a big chunk of extra efficiency. And so by extension, you'd expect improved thermals, right? Well, yes and no, really. What's obvious to me is that the fan is a lot more active on my old Switch, but you know, it's hardly loud as such. The thermal assembly is likely set to keep the Switch at a certain temperature, and that will be easier on the new model, so the fan is quieter. But with a similar target in terms of temperatures, we shouldn't expect much difference in how hot the unit is to the touch. Still, I ran the thermal camera over both switches, First of all, docked and charging the battery. Heat from the vent at the top peaks at around 54 degrees Celsius on the OG switch, and I hit around 49 to 50 on the Mariko update. Interesting stuff, but probably more relevant to our interests is undocked temperatures. For this test, I pulled out both switches from their docks and allowed the battery to continue charging up to 90% before disconnecting. 
Hot spots are seen on the side and the bottom of the unit where temperature peaks at around 46 Celsius on the original switch. The rear of the machine is also warm at around 44 degrees. I suspect that kind of L shape there is likely the heat pipe with the white point representing the location of the Tegra X1 underneath the shell. The switch is down clocked here GPU wise so there is uh, less heat to output. The vent at the top now hits a peak of 48 degrees. Interestingly the same test points on the new model switch produce the same degree of heat. Maybe a touch less? A max of 46 degrees or thereabouts on the front hotspots and around 44 degrees on the rear where the processor is likely to be located. And yeah, the vent at the top, 46 degrees. Okay then, so let's talk about system performance next. Nintendo has made it clear that the new Switch is just like the old one in terms of the frame rates you'll get in game. And the inference is that the Tegra X1 frequencies on CPU, GPU and uh, the memory controller will be the same. And I think that's a claim that's on the level. But one thing that's interesting is that as well as a new Tegra X1 processor, Nintendo has also paired the chip with more power efficient LPDDDR4X memory. And I do wonder whether this may have caused a slight adjustment in performance. So check this out, see what I mean. Mortal Kombat 11's replay system is a great test for CPU and GPU performance, especially on the Colosseum level. What is interesting here is that the new switch does seem to run ever so slightly smoother than the old one. And yeah, I didn't expect this. The variance is very small, let's be clear about that. Very small, undetectable by the human eye. And it may well be down, in this case, to dynamic elements varying in the background uh, as we compare the two machines side by side. So I ran the same replay several times on both of my switches. And in all cases, the Mariko machine continues to deliver that very slight boost to performance. The increase sits very firmly in margin of error territory here, but the new machine does seem to be consistently ever so slightly faster. I thought I'd try the classic Zelda Korok Forest run too. And here's the first result. On the face of it, the Mariko switch is delivering faster performance again in this classic trouble spot. What I do want to note though is that the positioning of the game camera here is all important. I tried to get it right, but uh, further tests show how volatile this can be. Regardless of the five tests I did on both the Logan and Mariko machines, four of them showed the new unit to sustain 30 FPS a touch more consistently. If this is a memory bandwidth thing, handheld tests would be more illuminating, but unfortunately I don't have access to a mobile capture output on the new Switch as of now. So, well, what do we make of this? I think it's an interesting observation to make, but by and large, it's an academic one. I really wanna stress here that any difference is minimal, and if there are variations in memory bandwidth responsible, they simply won't be noticeable if the game in question is limited by GPU or CPU instead. And here's a case in point, Resident Evil Revelations 2, 1080p unlocked frame rate. I mean, basically you can see that the performance readout is the same. I did note one clip where the graph is very slightly elevated with the new switch, but everything else I tested on this title exactly the same. Saints Row the Third. Well, a dynamic gameplay means that we can't really benchmark, but this does highlight that even if there is a difference, chances are you wouldn't be able to tell. Been kind of obsessed with this for a couple of days though. The Zelda tests really seem to show something. Mortal Kombat 11 again, likewise, but to a much lower degree. Beyond that though, the jury's out really. It could just be nothing. As we learn more about the machine, any differences could come more to the forefront. But for now, I wouldn't worry about it. Overall then, I'd say that beyond the implementation of the new Mariko processor, the latest switch is much the same as the old one. Screen calibration apart. But what this does mean is that the opportunity to correct some of the older models' most egregious issues has not been taken. And that's a bit of a shame. So, yes, the wobbly, ineffectual kickstand, for example. Well, that's still wobbly and ineffectual. My other major issue with the Switch is the weak Wi-Fi reception, with a connection that all too easily drops out and has very poor range compared to pretty much every one of my other mobile devices. 
a new Wi-Fi chip or a media antenna would have gone a long way for a new switch, but I couldn't find any improvements at all in this regard. Wi-Fi conditions can change all the time of course, but even testing both units one after the other seemed to result in the same or even slightly lower throughput on the new machine. My gut feeling here is that Nintendo simply didn't make any changes here at all, and the firm's emissions tests to the FCC would back that up. To wrap up then, I've always had what you might call a bit of a soft spot for the Switch, and this replacement model is, you know, a nice piece of kit. Effectively, it's the same machine as it always has been, and yes, that means that the battery capacity is the same at 4310 milliamp hours, but the core Tegra X1 is smaller, cooler, and more efficient, and so by extension, you get a big, big improvement to battery life. And this sets the stage quite nicely for the upcoming Switch Lite. We know that it's using the same Marico processor, the same LPDDDR4X memory, but it is a new hardware design, so maybe Nintendo will take the opportunity, at the very least, to address the Wi-Fi issue. But that's where I'm going to sign off for now with the usual call to action, by which I mean, of course, liking this video, subscribing to Digital Foundry if you haven't already, and yes, of course, ringing the bell for instant, instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. Of course, we have a Patreon where for a super low contribution, you can get hold of pristine quality video downloads. And more than that, you can feel warm and fuzzy in the knowledge that you're supporting the team more directly in making videos like this possible. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And yeah, just generally, thanks for watching.